pray. Father, we thank you and praise you as we dive into your word today, as we look back to where we've been to maybe reinforce some of the values of the past few weeks. As we look forward to where you're going to take us, Lord Jesus, would you inspire our hearts and get us excited about what is to come? And as we talk about the series that we're in, would you protect our families, guide them, direct them, give them strength, reinforce us, help us to understand and gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of things that we might not have known in the area of families so that we could have strong families as we lead um, out the end of this year and into 2018. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So as I shared, I want to recap just a little bit. I want to set the stage for the future, and then we're going to, um, you know, kind of hone in on our current message series that we're starting today. This is Us, a family series that will take us through the end of the year. Roughly 90 days ago, we began casting a vision we're calling Vision 365. Near you on a chair, there's a card that says Vision 365. Hopefully you have one. One of the cards has our mission. We exist to bring glory to God by making disciples that exhibit a lifestyle of worship community, service, and multiplication. You might have a different card that on the back shares the, the life verse for the year. So whichever one you have, it does not matter. I would love for you to keep these near you, to pray over them, to believe God for them, to stand in agreement that these things would come to pass to help us advance the kingdom of God right here in Jacksonville. So what is Vision 365 all about? Just as a reminder, first and foremost, we want to see 365 people come to know Jesus in 2018. This is going to be bad if that's all of y'all that are clapping. We want to see our friends come to know Jesus. We want to see our family members come to know Jesus. You definitely want to see your worst enemies come to know Jesus, right? I mean, we want to see them come to know Jesus. So what's that going to take? We're believing partially in the spirit first and foremost, but we're also believing in the natural. So there's some things in the natural that would help that make sense, that would help it manifest itself. That means we need to have about 25 families visiting each and every week. We're close to that at times. Last week we had 22 families. Thank you guys for inviting people. This week, obviously, is a holiday weekend, so attendance is a little lower than normal, but we're doing it. You're advancing the kingdom. You're inviting people. Um, to statistically see that happen, we probably need about 1,000 in weekly attendance. We're around 800 right now. We need to see a little bit of growth as we approach the new year. We need to be relentless about inviting people to come to know Jesus. It's going to take finances as well. That's why there's a financial component. We need 25,000 every single week to be able to advance the kingdom of God in a healthy way to to have the right staff, to have the right facility, to have the right ability to do the outreaches, um, that's what we need. So I'm asking you, put this on your refrigerator, put it in your car, put it somewhere where you'll see it in your prayer time and continue to lift that up in prayer. I believe that God answers prayers. I hope you do too. And man, I, I just know it's going to happen. So personally, to accomplish this vision, it means we're going to have to be whole in spirit, soul, and body. That's what 2018 is about, being whole in spirit, soul, and body. We need to understand and live out our God-given mission and calling. That means if you don't know what you're called to do, that means if you don't know where you're called to serve, if that means that you don't know how to evangelize and outreach, I want to encourage you to take classes that we offer like Foundations of the Faith. Go to partnership. Go and do whatever it takes to learn what God has given you and equipped you to use you to make a difference in the lives of others. We all need to be fully engaged as fully devoted followers of Christ. It's not time to play church anymore, church, right? This isn't a generation where we can play church. We need to be the church to reach the city. We need to be the church to reach the city. So while statistics help tell the story, the battle is really spiritual in nature, is it not? We talked about that a lot in recent weeks, the battle, the spiritual warfare during our Stranger Things series. Perhaps you missed it or new to Journey. It was a very monumental, uh, life-changing series for us. I would encourage you to download the app, go online, watch some of those messages, get caught up, get plugged in, learn about these spiritual battles that we find ourselves in. We talked about this epic battle that's going on in heavenly places that affects us with ramifications here on earth. We talked about the fact that good and evil are real, that there is an enemy who wants to take us out. 
Have any of you ever sensed his presence, right? He's trying to take out families. He's trying to disable us. He's trying to make us casualties of war. We talked about the fact that there is an eternity and that people are going to die here in the natural and go on to live in either heaven or hell for all eternity. And we want to take a whole lot of people to heaven with us, right? These are the things we've been talking about in recent weeks, that God does not leave us defenseless, but leaves us empowered by the Holy Spirit. He forgives us by the blood of Jesus Christ. He gives us tools spiritually to engage in warfare that we might advance the kingdom of God. This church is the day and age that we live in. We all have a role to play. We all have a calling. We all have a gifting Now's not the time to sit on the sidelines. This mission will not be accomplished if we're watching and being Monday morning quarterbacks instead of being engaged in the battle on the field. That's what God created you for. He created you with a mission in mind. He wants you to live that out. I hope that excites you. You see, because I believe with all my heart that God has called you as difference makers. With the near-term purpose of seeing the people of Journey help rescue 365 souls from an eternity in hell. Journey, we truly are on a rescue mission of epic proportions. Perhaps the most memorable moment of the series for me was when we played that short video clip from Hacksaw Ridge. Does anybody remember that? Were you here that week? You remember it? I mean, I was really moved by that, you know? None of us are guaranteed a tomorrow and seeing Desmond Doss's resilience to climb up there in the midst of that earthly battle and save about 70 lives that very evening inspired me prophetically to say that very day, what would it look like if you lived your life in such a way that you dreamed and asked God to have him present 70 individuals before you that you had an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with that they might be saved? Could you imagine if we led out that way corporately where each of us had that in the back of our mind, like, Lord, who are you going to put in my path today? And we'll have an opportunity to share the gospel in season or out of season. That means if it's a bad day, you're somehow going to use me in the midst of this very bad day to share the good news of the gospel. If it's a good day, amen, it's going to be all the better because I get to talk about you and what you've done in my life. What would happen if we all live that way, if we realize that eternity really is what mattered and not the earthly things that the devil tries to distract us with? How different might life be? Don't we get bogged down in the important all the time or the urgent that's around us? See, the devil throws all those things at us to try to distract, to keep us in a fog. But Journey, you are a people on mission, and we're going to hone that in in 2018. I believe it with all my heart, because guess what? Do you believe it or not? 2018 is right around the corner. I mean, Thanksgiving stuff just got packed away. Come on, Jesus, right? Some of y'all still have your Christmas stuff up from last year, so you're good. But we put up our Christmas stuff, you know, the day after Thanksgiving. So we got that out there. We started to get it up. And, you know, Christmas 2017 will be here before you know it. Um, the older I get, it seems like they go by faster and faster. Does anybody relate to what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, it, it keeps going by. But, man, the joys. I hope your Thanksgiving was as ours was, where you got to spend it with some family. Um, hopefully there weren't any riots in your house. This year was like riot-free for us in our house. It was actually amazing. I mean, there's been some past Thanksgivings where it turned into a brawl and stuff. But, I mean, this time it was so sweet. The grandkids were there, and we just had a really good time. And we need to cherish with great gratitude, as we talked about last week, all those little moments when God gives them to us, right? But we do need to look forward selflessly and believe with all our hearts, James 4, 3. It says this, you do not have because you do not ask. You know, I'm not a name it and claim it kind of a guy. If you know me, that's just not me. But I believe that verse comes to pass when we're asking not for ourselves, but when we're interceding on behalf of others. You have not because you ask, Lord, why can't we believe for 365 people to come to know Jesus? Why can't, we believe, why can't we believe that God would use us to see 70 people come to know Jesus in our lifetimes? I'm believing for it. I'm believing for everything that we put forth in Vision 365. God says, write down the vision and make it plain, and then it'll happen in Jesus' name. Because none of it is about us. Not one iota of that is about Journey Church. Not one iota of that is about any of us prospering personally. Every bit of it is about seeing the kingdom of God advance, seeing people come to know him as their Lord and Savior. 
So I ask you, I implore you to believe with me all that we've been talking about up to this point. And then may we be equipped as we move forward into 2018 to see these things come to pass, right? So what is 2018 going to look like? I want to give you a glimpse. You guys are the core. You guys are the ones who are here on Thanksgiving weekend. Come on, Jesus, right? So let's give you a little inside information about what is to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be healthy in every way if we're going to see this vision be realized. It's going to take that. Do you realize that? If you're tired, if your body is worn out, do you think you're going to be able to go see 70 people come to know Jesus? It's not going to happen as easy. How are you going to be fired up spiritually if your body is not fired up along with it, right? Come on. How many of you have gotten to a season where you were working out and I mean, it really felt good. Has anybody ever been there? Come on, like you felt good. Self-esteem was there. You know, the reverse is kind of true too. When we aren't in that kind of a flow, it's hard for us. And I'm not looking for all of us to be Superman's. That'd be cool though, right? Like, woo, come on. You know, that's not what I'm talking about here. It says that we be healthy, that we eat right. Not like Thanksgiving weekend with all the gravy and stuff, right? Like, I mean, like that we have some sort of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that we could put into practice. So that's why I wanted to kick off the year with that health and fitness expo. There's a lot that we don't know that we don't even know. What if we were equipped with that knowledge? So we're going to kick it off in that way where we're going to have a focus during the year of starting to get physically fit, of starting to get nutritionally fit, of starting to get healthy in our body so that we have the energy to lead out with this kind of aggress aggressive mission that we have before us. So what about spiritually? How are we going to advance? We're going to do something really cool. We've been planning for this for six months. Do you know that the Bible is an epic story from page to page, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation? It is the epic love story of God for each of our lives. But how many of you have tried to read the Bible in a year and failed? How many of you tried time and time again and failed? <laughs> right? I mean, so what if we made part of that fun? What if we made it engaging? What if we told a story where from beginning to end, from the youngest among us to the eldest among us, we're trying to accomplish this together? The objective is not just to read every page, but to look at the major themes of the Bible, to look at the major stories. So we've been working behind the scenes with our children's church, with our teens, and with the adult church, and we're going to do the story of the Bible throughout the course of 2018. So what's going to happen is the kids are going to be, say, if, let's pick a topic like David and Goliath or something, right? So say we're doing David and Goliath here in the main auditorium. That means that week they're going to be doing David and Goliath in teens. That means that week they're going to be doing David and Goliath with your kids. That means as parents, you're going to receive parent sheets that you will be able to take home that are going to be given for one month where you'll know all the stories that are going to be discussed. So when you get out of church and you're driving home, you could actually talk about the stuff that y'all are learning together as part of this greater story of God that will be on mission together. Many of our small groups are going to be doing the big idea study. What was the big idea from the week? Gathering together to talk about that in greater detail so that we could get the meat of the Bible down deep within us. In the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, we will learn and be on mission together. Spirit, soul, and body, we will learn together. So I want to encourage you to step out in that, to, to bring us to the place where we even find ourselves today. When we talk about the spiritual battles, one of the things I've noticed is that the devil likes to attack in the area of the family. He always tries to do it. He tries to create a fatherless generation. How many of you are from a broken home? How many of you have been a, a, a son or daughter of a divorced family, or maybe that you're even been divorced yourself, right? Many, many, many people in the room look around it. It's one of the devil's primary tactics. He wants to divide families because he knows that when he does, you become fatherless children in one regard. And then how do you trust God, your father, when you don't even know what it's like to have your dad around? He wants to separate. He wants to divide. He wants to keep families apart. And then when you go even a few steps deeper into the midst of that, um, do you think that the devil wants to try to distort um, sex between a man and a woman in our generation? right? 
He gives us this scourge of pornography that's out there that's stealing the hearts and minds of our men and women alike, creating an environment where the internet is freely available and it's even infecting the young people. And then how do they have healthy sexual relationships as they get older when they're inundated with that kind of a thing all the time? We as Christians need to believe against that. We need to stand against that kind of stuff. We need to learn. We need to overcome, right? Y'all know there's a battle, right? Y'all better start getting in. If not, the devil, you're wondering why the devil's taking over your family. We need to be fired up. We need to be all in the word. We need to know it inside and out. But even more than that, we need to be able to live it out. See, the devil's even trying to challenge the concept of biblical marriage in our generation, is he not? The devil's even trying to challenge the concept of gender identity in our day and age, is he not? These are battles that we're facing and our children are facing. And guess what? God will win because no matter what the devil says, guess what? It's always a lie, right? But sadly, many are deceived by these lies and God wants us to have victory. So if we're getting ready to march forward into a spiritual battle in 2018, we need to have our families on guard. Can you get an amen for that, right? We want a hedge of protection around us. We want to plead the blood of Jesus over the people and the families of Journey Church. We don't want to give the devil an opportunity to steal, kill, and destroy in the area of families. So we want to do this series that we're starting right here, right now today called This Is Us as a reinforcement of God's biblical vision for the family and how we can protect that. So I hope you really do enjoy the next few weeks. Obviously, we picked anybody This Is Us fans with the TV show, anybody in here? If you haven't, there's something wrong with you. You need to go watch that show. It's actually a very good one. Why don't we watch just about a two-minute little clip of it to get us inspired and fired up about this series that is to come. Saying I do means saying I will. I need you to help me, please. Are you laying down, Jack? Big three? Big three! I watch football with my dad. I'd like to meet him sometime. Okay. I know it's gonna be a little creepy. This is your dad? Lucky cow. You are the reason I've been waiting on this year. You had a breakdown. I'm okay. My father didn't have a lot of time left, and he'd very much like to show me where he's from. Take good care of you, too. I'll send you a postcard. <laughs> I want you to picture the love of your life. Imagine that you have one shot to win her back. The best thing that ever happened to me was you telling me that you'd marry me. I'm still in love with you. Uh, Kate, can I get one right here? Kate, right here. What are you doing? Give me just one day where you're the star. my son. I loved him, and I know that he loved me. You look awesome. Was the hat too much? The hat is everything. That's a real peacock feather. I did everything wrong by you, and you've done everything right, son. I know that this is the biggest moment of your life. You are the world's greatest husband, and you're going to be the world's greatest dad. I love our life. I just want you. changed me. I will love you today and every day for the rest of my life. Fan of the show, maybe you will become so after this particular message here. Y'all didn't clap for that? You're like stuck in the drama of it? I mean... So the show can be a real tearjerker at times. It's easy to watch, especially for those of us who might be 40-something or plus. Um, I don't know about you. If you're 40-something or plus, you might remember the 70s. Some of you are a little bit older. You might not remember the 70s. If you were a child of the 60s, you just don't remember the 70s. But, uh, you, you know, you get, <laughs> you get this. They're getting it now. Like, all younger people are like, what is he talking about? And you're like, flower power. Come on, Jesus. Um, you know, so... For me, it's kind of a neat show because I grew up in the 70s and you get to get a glimpse back at what it was like when they show the childhood scenes and then they come back to the current age. Um, how many of you kind of have a celebrity crush, if you're honest, you have some sort of a celebrity crush? 
Only, man, you guys are just non-participatory today. I think we all at some point, so Mandy Moore, come on guys, come on fellas. Mandy Moore is just that, you know, great, except when you watch her on Twitter and she's super liberal. So I don't know, I don't understand about these things, but Mandy Moore's always been a bit of a celebrity crush, so it makes it all the more easy to watch that particular show. Um, but they deal with issues like the death of a child is dealt with in that show, um, triplets, adoption, finding the dad that you'd never known, watching your dad pass away from cancer, obesity, addiction, the joys of victorious moments in life, the pains of the more difficult moments, and so much more. There's something in every episode that people seem to relate to. It's one of the most popular shows on television, and I think probably because there's glimpses of each of those kinds of issues in our own lives. We live in this fallen, sinful world, and there's pain that abounds around us, and then there's these glimpses of glory that we get to see in the midst of it so we get to we get to see a glimpse maybe of us in the middle of that show so in the coming weeks we're going to explore many of these same kinds of issues as we navigate through many of the stages of life so one week we're going to go and say from a kid's perspective you know pastor kevin's going to actually come and teach that one what does it mean to have a biblical family and raise your kids in the nurture and admonition of the lord maybe pastor brinson will show up and talk to us about teens come on Somehow I survived the teen years. He's in the midst of, you know, coaching the teen years. Um, and then others are going to come along the way, myself and others, to share maybe different stages of life where we find ourselves. Because guess what? We're all part of a family, are we not? We're all part of a family. But then at the same time, there's spiritual analogies along the way. Where are we at in our spiritual life? Are we spiritual infants in need of growing up? Are we spiritual children that are pitching a hissy fit? Are we spiritual teenagers that are starting to mature and starting to get it and ready to go out there into life? Are we spiritual parents that are sowing into the lives of others? See, our goal here at Journey Church is that we would all be spiritual parents, that we would all be mature in the faith, ready to share our faith in season or out of season, that we would have healthy biblical families and a healthy biblical spiritual life, and that should the Lord tarry, may we all be so blessed as to become spiritual grandparents. See, the joy of surviving your teen is that one day you begin to become a grandparent. In Jesus' name, it's such a good time in the Lord. Yes, healthy spiritual parents. See, God started with family in mind, and that's why the devil worked so hard to snuff it out. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds, and over the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created them, male and female. He created them, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over every living thing that moves here on the earth. See, God had a plan from the beginning. Do you believe it's still his plan? Yes, it is his plan. Now, sin came in and corrupted that, but let's look at this original plan for just a moment. See, it says, let us create man in our image. There's biblical community of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that gives us the perfect image of what life and family could be like. And when he created us both individually and as couples, guess what? Our job is to reflect the image of the glory of God to the world around us. We're called to be whole in spirit, soul, and body. We're called to be holy. We're called as Christians to be a reflection of who God is so that when people gaze upon us and gaze upon our families, not that we're going to not have problems. Guess what? Your family's going to have problems, right? There's going to be challenges along the way, but how do you handle those in the midst of them? Guess what? Even in the most difficult of circumstances, you can still reflect God's image to a lost and hurting world around you where they will look at you and say, how in the world are you getting through that? God is giving me the strength. God is giving me the peace. God is bringing me the hope. He loves you. He's got a perfect plan for your life, right? So we're called to have dominion meant to rule, to lead, to have authority to God and direct. As Christians, you're called to be leaders. We're called to set the pace of the conversation out there in community, not called to conform to the image of the world. We're called to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
We're called to call out things in love that aren't right. So when God, when the devil attempts to challenge biblical Christianity and a biblical view of the family and a biblical view of man and womanhood, then guess what? We can challenge those issues in love, can we not? See, I think the church has done it in hate far too often. But guess what? God had a plan in his word. It's articulated right there, right? We need to live that out and not be ashamed of it, but we need to love people because guess what? Sin not only affects our gender identity, sin infects all of us. Every single one of us. No one sin is above any other sin. All of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God, right? So your sin is different than somebody else's sin. When you're in the midst of your sin, do you hope that people will love you? I hope so, right? Does that mean we condone your sin? No way, right? But it means we love you through it. This is us. We're family. We're dysfunctional. But we love one another and we speak the truth to one another in love as Christ would lead and direct because we're called to lead, to transform. He has you here with that in mind. He says, be fruitful. That means he wants us not to just have a bunch of babies, which is kind of a good thing, right? Where's the fruit of the Spirit? It's articulated in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What if we woke up every morning and read that one? Lord, help me to exhibit more of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I need that. I don't know about you. But there's moments that my life doesn't live up to that. Lord, help me to conform to your image, to look that way. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord said, it is, good, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So the two become one flesh. The standards of the Bible remain the same. Now in covenant marriage as in family, we are to reflect the glory of God. So as a couple right now, if you are married, if you are dating, if you are single, is your life in that way reflecting the image of the glory of God? If you are dating and you are um, having sex but you ain't married, guess what? Is that sin? If you're single and you out there flirting around too much and doing stuff you ain't supposed to be doing, is that sin? If you're doing it with the same sex couple, is that sin? If you're doing it with the opposite sex, is it still sin? Yes, right? God's standard is the same amongst all of those. Guess what? One of the benefits of marriage is you get to have sex as often as you want. And you don't have to feel guilty about it in Jesus' name, right? <laughs> Some of you are clapping. Some are like, what? I didn't know that happens. Like, yeah. Yes, there is no shame. The two have become one, right? So can we be real and address some of these issues in the coming weeks? I think we can. I think we could have fun with them. I think we could be real about them. I think we can reflect God's image in them and through them as we learn about what a healthy family looks like. And I hope that excites you. We're to demonstrate through our marriages and our children the fruit of the Spirit. It all sounds good in theory, right? But some of you are saying... That's not what my marriage, my life, or my children look like right now. You're right. Sin quickly creeped into the garden. Our first father, Adam, and mother Eve were deceived. Pain, death, divorce, sickness, fighting, rebellious children, abortion, all entered into the picture. Our lives personally, our marriages, our children all become hard ground to till, especially apart from a relationship with God. But even in the garden, in the midst of our sin, God did not leave us without hope. He began to speak of this one, this promised Savior who would come to redeem all mankind, Jesus Christ, who would die in our place for our sins, who came on a grand rescue mission to save us, to save our families and make all things right and make all things new. So why did God do that? It says it simply in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, sin has a way of turning us all into spiritual orphans. When we sin, we can orphan our children. Does that make sense to you? So the Lord wants to help us in that. In fact, 
you know, I told my story to you the other week where I was an orphan, so to speak. My mom was a single mom, and I'm so glad that God wants to adopt us into his family. Galatians 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set forth by his father. And the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. See, I've had the privilege of being adopted twice, once in the natural and once by God himself. What a privilege and an honor that is. In the natural, I gained a brother and a sister. In the supernatural, I gained Jesus Christ, the one and only begotten Son of the Father who loves me enough that he would come and die in my place for my sins because he wanted me to be a part of his family. Many of you are also heirs to that same kingdom, to that same brother, to that same father. Come on, Jesus. I pray that that excites you. I pray that you remember that, that you don't forget about his goodness and his grace and his love and his kindness. See, sin robbed me of the ability in the natural to say Abba, Father, to a dad when I was growing up. Maybe the devil did the same to you and your family. That's why it's all the more important for us who are spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers who are in this room to continue to do that for the next generation, to be there for them, to stand in the gap when some of our teens don't have the right mothers and fathers in the natural, to let them know that God's love still exists in the midst of a sinful world. But if you are far apart from God this morning, let me tell you something, there is hope. He died that you might have a relationship with him. He came from heaven to earth on a rescue mission that he invites all of us into as believers to be a part of that rescue mission for those who would come after us. May we engage in the battle. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, I thank you for your presence and your power today, Lord Jesus. As we've recapped where we've been, as we look forward to what is to come, and as we land right squarely in the midst of our families, maybe we reflect on this past weekend and some spent all too much time with their families and they're glad some of them have gone home. Others didn't get enough time with their families and longed to spend more time with them. Others sadly have recently lost one that they love. They're trying to deal with the cope and with the pain of that situation. Father, we find ourselves like this is us in the midst of this crazy world that we live in where sin seems to abound, where it seems so hard to get it right. But your word promises us that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome, that we could be victorious, that our families and our lives as individuals can reflect your glory to a lost and hurting world, that we can be the light that you promised us to the nations, Lord Jesus. May we reflect with great gratitude the very fact that you saved us, that we're here today, that you've delivered us, that for those that are in the midst of the struggle, that you're there with us, that you're guiding us and directing us, and that you're going to lead us into safer ground, Lord God, that you're giving us a peace in the midst of these difficult circumstances. We pray for those wayward children. We pray for those broken relationships. We pray for complete and total restoration. Father, equip us for the battle. We pray a hedge of protection over our families right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that you give us wisdom to navigate these subjects in the days ahead in such a way that inspires us and reminds us that we are victorious in you. And if today there be anybody here who wouldn't call themselves a believer, Lord, I pray that this very moment that they would surrender their lives to you, that they would say, Jesus, you are the son of God who died that I might have life. They sense it in their belly right now, this very moment, that they can cry out to someone and say, Abba, Father, and you will listen and you will be there for them. There might even be some who are here that are believers, but you've strayed far and today's the day you know you need to come home. If you're of either of those two groups, I would love to pray for you. And Jesus is waiting with open arms to welcome you into his family. You are an orphan no more. He wants to adopt you and love on you and care for you and be there with you. 
If today's a day where you know you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to him, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, nobody's looking around. Would you do me a favor and just put your hand up real high and I'll pray for you. Is that you today? Well, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that we're amongst family and amongst believers. Would you equip us? Would you link us together, Father God? Would we help one another? Would we be there for one another? Would we care for one another? Would we go and live on mission to see our families expand and the kingdom of God advanced in our generation and in our region? Thank you for calling us here for such a time as this. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I give you glory. May this coming week and this coming month be just an awesome one for you in Jesus' name. Go and have a great day. God bless you guys.